All right, uh, thank you for joining us out here for this webinar on Kubernetes backup and mobility with Gaston Katen and VMware Cloud, Cloud Marketplace. Um, this is uh, your host, Gaurav Rishi. I'm the head of product here at Gaston. And I'm very excited to talk to you about what it means to be protecting your Kubernetes workloads with backup and mobility. Also out here, um, we are going to be talking about some of our partnership constructs between VMware and Gaston. And to help me actually carry the show forward is Weber Kamra, who's the co-founder and VP of engineering at Gaston, as well as Niharika, who's going to be uh, talking a lot about the cloud marketplace and leads the product marketing and strategy there. In terms of the agenda for this particular show, we'll go ahead and have me talk about the VMware Cloud Marketplace, talk about how you can actually go ahead and discover and deploy third-party solutions. The focus for us here is going to be on cloud native and Kubernetes. As a lot of you probably already know, VMware is doubling down and now has Kubernetes as a first-class entity in vSphere. And so we are going to use that as a way to also dive into Cast and K10, where WebHub is going to talk about once you have applications deployed, how do you go ahead and protect them in terms of backup, as well as going ahead and getting some of the portability benefits of moving them across uh, these workloads across different types of environments inside your Kubernetes clusters or regions. And uh, not only will we talk about it, but we'll actually get into a demo and so you can see this for yourself and talk about the benefits. We are going to leave enough time for question and answers, and uh, we hope to make this interactive. So please, feel free to go ahead and post your questions on the webinar chat. And towards the end, I will try and get to them so that both WebHub and me can go ahead and answer that. So it should be a fun show and um, hope to keep it interactive. With that said, let me hand it over to Ni so she can go and talk about VMware, Cloud Marketplace. Thanks, Gaurav. Uh, so uh, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, wherever you guys are, uh, you know, uh, to everyone. And thanks for joining us. Um, as Gaurav mentioned, I'm Ni, nee, and I work on uh, the VMware Cloud Marketplace product, specifically within product marketing and strategy. And so today, I'd like to just talk you through a few slides on what Marketplace is and how it exactly relates to uh, Kasten solutions. Uh, so to start off with, you know, as the name suggests, uh, VMware Cloud Marketplace is a service that we offer at VMware, which essentially enables our customers uh, to discover and deploy third-party solutions uh, to on various cloud environments. So all of these solutions which are deployable actually go through a validation program. So our customers actually know that, hey, when I deploy this solution, it's actually going to work on my VMware cloud environment. Uh, next slide, please. So if you look at uh, what we're trying to achieve or what we actually uh, enable for, for uh, various parties uh, today, uh, VMware Cloud Marketplace essentially facilitates an interaction between two parties. On one hand, you have our partners, such as Kasten, and on the other hand, you have the you know, wide VMware customer base. And so Marketplace becomes a way where these two parties can actually interact and intersect with each other. Uh, so for partners, of course, uh, they you know, get to uh, provide their solutions to the VMware customer base. Um, we offer a very easy way to kind of uh, publish and manage their listing on Marketplace. Uh, and partners do get uh, access to features such as analytics and notifications uh, that actually come with the Marketplace product. Um, on the other hand, if you look at what customers are getting, uh, as I mentioned, you know, Marketplace is a great way to find solutions uh, that you might need for a particular use case. Maybe you need a particular solution category, things like that. Uh, and it's also a very easy way to actually deploy these solutions to your VMware environments. Um, and as I mentioned, all of these deployable solutions go through a validation program that is set by VMware uh, to ensure that these solutions actually work on the VMware environment. Uh, and similarly, customers also get access to features such as analytics and notifications that are inbuilt into Marketplace. Um, if you look at the solutions that are actually available on Marketplace, uh, we're really trying to include any type of solution that really extends the value of the VMware platforms for our customers. So this may be things like backup and disaster recovery, which of course we'll talk about later today, uh, or it might be things like security, developer tools, storage, and so on. And lastly, uh, when you look at the actual cloud environments that we're connected with, so as I mentioned, uh, Marketplace makes it very easy to deploy third-party solutions to VMware environments. 
And so what are those environments, right? So right now we've integrated with a couple of uh, platforms already. Uh, so one is VMware Cloud and AWS. Uh, the other is VMware Cloud Director. The third is uh, VMware Tanzu Kubernetes Grid Integrated Edition, uh, which is uh, which was earlier called uh, VMware PKS, and uh, vSphere, of course, as well as a VMware Cloud Foundation. And in addition, we're also working on integrating with a couple of other VMware platforms. You know, things that folks use very commonly, things like VRLIS automation, uh, the Tanzu services, etc. Um, so that's kind of an overall picture. And as Gaurav mentioned, if there's any questions, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A and we'll get to them uh, at the end. Uh, but on the next slide, uh, I'd you know, like to talk about um, a little bit more about how Kasten plays it. So next slide, please. All right. So we looked at what VMware Cloud Marketplace is at a high level. Uh, but if you look at Kasten specifically, um, in this case, we're really facilitating the interaction between you know, our VMware customers, as well as uh, the users of Kasten, right? So we're, we're kind of connecting those two dots there. So for these VMware customers who use Kasten via, uh, via VMware Cloud Marketplace, you know, they get access to seamless deployment, they get access to a validated service. Kasten's K10 uh, solution has gone through the, uh, the partner ready for TKGI program. Um, and additionally, of course, things like analytics and notifications, as already mentioned. So if you look at what, you know, having K10 on Cloud Marketplace really means, right? So as Gaurav mentioned at the beginning, uh, VMware, you know, has really started to embrace Kubernetes and containers at a very wide company level. Uh, and so uh, having K10 really plays to that and really adds to that experience as well. Right now, companies already utilize things like, uh, you know, they, they actually run stateful applications on Kubernetes using things like first-class disks as well as cloud native storage on vSphere. Uh, however, day two operations also become important, right? And so by having, um, you know, K10 on Marketplace, we can actually extend uh, some of these, um, you know, day two operations to our VMware customers. So things like backup and uh, recovery, application mobility, disaster recovery, and so on, uh, through the overall Kubernetes data management platform that K10 offers, are now made available to our VMware customers. Uh, so in essence, uh, by having K10 on Marketplace, uh, our VMware customer base uh, get to you know, essentially run applications as well as manage their day two operations uh, on Kubernetes in a, very, uh, in a way that's very easy to access, easy to deploy, as well as easy to operate. Right. Um, and, you know, as, as a last note, I just want to mention that, um, you know, K10 is available on, uh, on it's integrated with TKGI, but it's also usable on, on vSphere. Uh, so, and I'm sure Gaura will kind of show you more of that in the, in the demo. Uh, so next slide, please. So lastly, uh, before I hand it off uh, to, to Vabov uh, for, you know, showing you the uh, quick look at, at the demo as well as more, more on K10. I uh, just wanted to show you how K10 actually looks on the VMware Cloud Marketplace. So the screenshot you see here is actually a screenshot of the page on VMware Cloud Marketplace. So you can see that there's a lot of information, things like description, summary, uh, different versions of the app, et cetera. All of that information is available on this page. Uh, and then you can also see in the, in the top right corner, um, uh, deployment instructions. So these are actually available after you've logged in as a user of Marketplace. Uh, but you know, once you actually click on the deployment instructions, uh, you'll be, and you, know, you click through the license agreement, et cetera, all of that information, you'll be provided with the instructions to actually go ahead and start using this solution on your environment. Right, so if you want to check this out, if you want to check out the listing, you can feel free to actually go to our marketplace right now. Uh, marketplace is open for browsing, so even without logging in, you're free to kind of browse around, look, and see what's available. Uh, so you can go ahead and check that out, and then you know, of course, sign up to Marketplace, and then you'll be able to uh, see uh, kind of access K10 uh, via Marketplace as well. So uh, with that being said, I know I kind of, you know, ran through a little bit, uh, flew through my slides a little bit, but like I said, if you have, anyone has any questions, fe uh, feel free to ask them in the Q&A and I will surely get to them at the end of the presentation. Uh, but at this point, I'd love to hand it off to Vaibhav uh, so he can take you through the rest of the solution as well as, uh, you know, again, how um, a quick look at the demo and things like that. Go ahead. Thanks, Ni. Nee. Um... 
Hi, everyone. Um, we're really excited to be talking to everyone here about our partnership with VMware uh, and specifically about our integration into the cloud marketplace. Uh, VMware has been uh, doing a lot of innovation on kind of bringing Kubernetes um, to their customers, um, things like container native storage. Um, and with our partnership here, we've kind of built deep integration into those layers, um, as well as with what we're doing here with marketplaces, as, as Nee mentioned, makes it really easy, seamless for um, all of us to consume K10, make sure we have a validated solution out there for these, day, these critical day two needs. Um, so just to talk about Kasten and K10 a little bit, um, we will jump you know, very quickly into a live demo so that um, you know, we can see all of this live. But at a very high level, um, our platform is a self software only um, product, which is focused on data protection, data management for cloud native applications. Um, we have a unique approach, which is um, to be very application centric, um, which is very important in this world with the kind of applications that are being deployed in these environments. Um, but along with that, it's very important um, to be focused on, on operations and the op ops persona, um, which is uh, what our focus is. We make sure that from an operations perspective, you get complete visibility into what's happening in your environment, what applications are available, what your protection coverage is, um, where there might be gaps, um, as well as making sure that everything um, is fully automated in terms of um, your data protection needs. That being said, um, we our approach is to make sure that um, for developers who are building their applications in their environments, there really should be no impact, no change required to their applications um, in order for the platform to work, in order for operations to kind of meet those critical day two, uh, day two requirements and needs. Um, looking, the way we do it is with our K10 platform, which really is this um, uh, operator focused enterprise platform for backup and mobility. Um, application discovery, um, all the automation I talked about in terms of um, data protection, um, making sure things are very easy to use um, by having a full featured simple dashboard, uh, full featured API layer, uh, integration with all your kind of enterprise um, uh, products such as authentication and monitoring. And very important, um, having a focus on end-to-end -end security. Everything in our system, all the data that we're managing and dealing with um, is encrypted end-to-end. -end. Um, we have full for, uh, featured RBAC support and authentication support in our platform. So I'm gonna jump very quickly into a demo. And what we're gonna show you here is um, a, a VMware environment deployed with Kubernetes clusters in there. Uh, Kasten K10 is installed in that environment. And what we're gonna walk through is, you know, a variety, kind of a quick overview of the platform, but then also talk about these workflows and use cases, um, how application capture and discovery works in these environments, how simple it is for an operations team to just uh, restore any application um, from a previous point in time, as well as um, this very interesting use case around app mobility, which allows you to take a complete cloud native application um, with all its complexities um, and clone it in a different namespace, um, in a different cluster if you want, and even across different environments, um, uh, let's say on-prem to a kind of cloud environment uh, if needed. Okay. So let me jump, with that said, let me jump straight into the demo. Um, what you're seeing over here is a uh, vSphere 7.0 uh, environment. Uh, in this environment, I've got a couple of Kubernetes clusters deployed over here. We're gonna use this K10 demo cluster. And with vSphere 7, what you'll also see is um, what Ni nee mentioned earlier, things like cloud native storage, which is um, VMware's uh, abstraction and first class integration into container volumes. And so over here, for example, I can see from the vCenter view, all my container volumes that are in my, being used in my Kubernetes um, clusters. I've gone ahead and deployed K10 in one of these clusters already. And to do that, it's very simple. Oops. Um, let's go back. Uh, you go to the marketplace uh, that 
uh, dashboard over there once you're logged in you'll see deployment instructions over here and it is really a single command to go ahead and install k10 in your kubernetes environment okay. once you've gone ahead and installed k10 uh, k10 comes packaged with a full feature dashboard and that's actually what we're going to use today for the demo this is the dashboard view um, uh, for uh, k10 installed in that cluster so let's just kind of get familiar a little bit with this um, here, on the, when, you, when you see the dashboard for the first time, it automatically discovers all the applications that are in your environment, as well as gives you an, an overview of what the compliance status is. And this is really um, what the situation is in terms of data protection. Which applications do I have policies that are managing them? Which applications don't have policies? Um, and it's continuously monitoring the platform to see if any new applications are coming in. Um, to make sure that you can get alerts um, in case um, there's something that you don't have a policy for. Uh, we'll talk about policies later, but everything, all the automation in the platform is using policies. So you can very easily set up a backup policy to protect all your applications or specific applications, and we'll kind of walk through that workflow. Data is where you can see um, all the, where all the backup data is being uh, stored, as well as what the consumption is, so what is snapshots versus what is actually the backup data that's being moved outside of the cluster. And then if you start to look over here, you'll see um, what I was talking about earlier, our integration with RBAC. So I'm logged in as an admin user, but we have a full RBAC model, which allows you to configure users um, that have granular permissions. So for example, I could set up users for each of my applications where um, the application owners um, have access to go and backup and restore their own applications. Um, but not have any uh, interaction with anything else in the cluster. So you can set up those kind of um, kind of uh, roles in the environment as well. If you head on over into settings, what you'll see here is first off um, locations, and this, these are really our backup targets. Um, we support a variety of different object store backup targets, whether you're running in a cloud environment or you're running on-prem and you have an S3 compatible store you'd like to use as well as integration with um, kind of enterprise certificate authorities, everything you would expect for an enterprise solution. And so you can see over here, I've gone ahead and configured a backup target in AWS for myself. Uh, you can configure things such as disaster recovery for this entire environment. So this makes sure that if the cluster goes away, if the vCent, vSphere environment goes away, you can still recover all your applications and data from that kind of disaster recovery location. All right, and then on the bottom, you're gonna, and we'll see a little bit of this later, you see what activity is going on in the cluster, what jobs are running, how many artifacts is the platform managing, what is being retired, and, and we'll cover this um, as we go through the demo. So let's jump into applications um, and get a little bit more detail there. Uh, K10 not only discovers what applications are running in the environment, so you can see I've got five different applications installed here but it also goes ahead and discovers all the components that make up the application. I think this is really important because this is um, something that's built into the platform, which is this app integration. Uh, here for, for something like GitLab, we've gone ahead and discovered what are all the data components. So we're using five different volumes here. You can see that this is a very complex application with a number of workloads here. Um, custom workloads, but also off the shelf data services that are being used in this application. Things like Prometheus or things like Postgres or Redis. Right. We've also discovered everything else that you need, things like networking, config map, secrets. Think about everything you need for this application to be restored. Um, K10 automatically discovers all of that so that we can first A, capture that but also then go ahead and restore it and move it around to different environments if needed. So let's walk through what protection, how setting up a policy works in this environment. So you can see I've got five applications here, four of which actually have policies, but I've got this very simple MySQL application here, and it's a single node MySQL environment, um, which doesn't have any protection policies assigned to it. So let's go ahead and create a policy there and see what the richness is um, in that workflow. Um, so any policy starts off with an action um, that you want to you want to take, and in this case, since we're talking about data protection or backup, we start off with a snapshot action. Um, what K10 
K10 has is first class integration into those first VMware first class disks. So we will go ahead and leverage FCD snapshots um, to kind of capture the data and use that as a source for every backup that we take. So here's where you can configure um, uh, the snapshot workflow. You can configure how often it should run, um, you know, whether it should run on an hourly, daily, weekly cadence, but you can also get um, more granular if you wanted to um, and configure exact, exactly when you would um, want this to run, for example, within the R, or if you wanted this to run multiple times in R. Um, you can configure retention of these snapshots inside um, vCenter. Um, so that configures how long these snapshots are kept around. But then also what should happen once the snapshot is taken. So once the snapshot is taken, if you think about the data, that's still very much still on the vSphere cluster. And so if you enable backups, um, this allows you to move the data off those snapshots into those backup targets that we talked about. So over here, I can configure whether I want every snapshot to be moved over, or maybe I want snapshots every hour, but I want to move every daily snapshot over into that um, remote location. So I'm just going to configure every snapshot to be moved over for the demo. And it's going to go to that object store location we had defined. And you can independently configure what retention you want for these backups that are in the backup target. Um, what this allows you to do is have a very limited set of snapshots that are on the cluster itself because they, they have some impact and keep a more kind of longer retention schedule for things that are being moved to the object store target. You can choose, um, you know, you can get more granular in terms of um, any hooks or actions you would like to run after the export. You know, if you'd like to filter certain things out, um, any um, transformations that you would want to apply, you can actually do all of that through these kind of advanced settings. And then once you've kind of defined what the policy should do, um, here's where you can select what applications it should apply to. So if you notice in this case, we were trying to create a policy for that specific application, um, MySQL. So you can pick a specific application or multiple ones if you want. But you can also define uh, used labels. And this is where it gets really interesting, where you can define um, forward-looking policies. So for example, you can pick an existing label in the cluster, or you can say anything which um, has backup policy gold. Anything that has that, any application that has label, that label, this policy should apply to. So this allows you to create those forward-looking policies so that even if an application, a new application shows up, it's automatically protected and covered. Right? And you can integrate into your CI CD kind of workflow for those applications. So I'm just going to go back and pick that specific application here, MySQL. Um, and then finally, again, you can configure exactly what you want to back up if you want to. Right now, I'm just going to back up everything that makes up that application. But maybe you want to filter out um, secrets or certificates when you back up an application because those are auto-generated. So you have that flexibility over here to do that as well. Um, before I go ahead and click uh, create policy and we see what happens. I also want to highlight, um, just show you the, the, the back end for this. So something I didn't mention earlier is that everything that you're seeing on the dashboard is actually backed by an, an API, which is a Kubernetes API. So what that allows you to do, it, do is, um, first off, because it's a Kubernetes API, it will integrate into all your Kubernetes tooling that you already have in your environment, whether it be pipelines or, or any other kind of automation. Um, you don't need to download any new CLI or SDK. Um, and then you can, you know, throughout the platform, throughout the dashboard, you'll see these breadcrumbs, which actually show you what the API definition is. In case you wanted to go and um, run this yourself or put this into a Git repo for GitOps kind of um, use cases. Right? So let me go ahead and now create that policy. And if we go back to the dashboard now, what we'll start to see is first off, you saw that that application, which was unmanaged, has now transitioned into this state called non-compliant, which means um, there is a policy attached to it, but it hasn't run yet. So you're still not in compliance with, with what you define. So let's go ahead and run that policy manually because it'll run at the top at whatever R we define. In this case, I'm just gonna, there it is. I'm just gonna run it manually for, for now. And when I do that, well, first off, you saw we, we missed the transition, but the application has now transitioned into compliant because the app, the job is running. Um, what you will start to see here 
is that backup job first running, which is going ahead and looking at the application, taking snapshots off the workload, it's capturing all of that data. So that's, that's already started and it's actually completed. So you see this um, snapshot for MySQL that we went ahead and took. Um, we captured all the spec, specs for the um, application, everything you need. Um, as soon as that completed, what you'll also start to see now is this export action get kicked off. Because we had said that this policy should move every snapshot into the backup target, um, as soon as the system notices that that has completed, it will now start that operation as well. And notice that this is happening asynchronously. So in terms of your um, RPO, um, that is defined by whenever you took the snapshot. And so you saw that export has now started. While we let that complete and we'll come back to this, I also wanna make sure I have time to talk about what the restore workflow looks like. So if I go to these, go to my applications view again, um, and I go to that MySQL application, if you start looking at restore points, you know, you can see the restore point from what I just took. I took that backup, um, which we just saw complete. Um, but you can also see manual restore points that I had taken earlier, and you'll see some of them being shown differently. So Let's explain that color coding a little bit. The one over here, uh, the one in blue, is actually the restore point that is still local to the cluster. Um, and the one over here in green is the one that was exported to object store. And based on your retirement settings over time, um, let's say you have um, more uh, frequent um, kind of retirement setup for your local snapshots, the blue ones will disappear and you'll be left behind with the green ones. So for example, you can see for Tuesday 922, that's kind of what I had configured and you're left with this backup in the object store target. Right. Let's actually look at what the restore workflow looks like. Um, so if I go ahead and look at that restore point from you know, a few minutes ago, um, you'll see that um, it's very straightforward for me to go restore in place. So if I just wanted to repave the application and bring back everything as of 925, um, I just go ahead and hit that restore as my SQL button. If I keep all my default options, it is going to bring back the exact same application at that point of time. I also have the flexibility, of course, of picking and choosing exactly what I want. So maybe I don't want to bring back a secret um, and, and I can uh, choose that very easily through the dashboard here. I can also do some really interesting things, which is I can restore, um, for example, a clone of this application in a different namespace. So that's actually gonna go ahead and do that, where I'm gonna restore it as a clone um, in, a, in a new namespace. So we'll go ahead and click that. Before I do that, I wanted to highlight some really interesting kind of features that we have that are very powerful, especially when it comes to restoring an application in a different environment, or um, you know, it really gives you a lot of powerful options with what you can do with your, these restore points. One of them, for example, is transforms. So what transforms allow you to do is dynamically, um, just through a programmatic kind of API uh, uh, operation, uh, transform what happens during the restore. So for example, I can do things like change the storage class of the application. Let's say you, in, in, in vSphere, you defined a Kubernetes storage class for a specific data store, and I wanted to restore in a different data store. I can very easily say, um, change the storage class when I'm restoring to a, to a different data store storage class, and that, that, that operation would apply when the restore operation happens. Um, this is also where I can handle things like migration into different environments. Let's say I'm um, restoring in an environment where um, a version of the resource has changed and I, I need to make some transformations. Um, you can programmatically kind of put that into this policy and apply that on the fly. Um, we see this in kind of migration workflows a lot or when people are going from trying to restore restore points from older version of Kubernetes into newer versions. Okay. So let me go ahead and click the restore over there. Remember, we're gonna restore in this new, new namespace. And if I go back to the dashboard now, um, what I should see is, well, first off, you'll see that this export to that object store location um, has now completed. So that's, that's been done. And it's actually been put into this object store location. Again, all of the data that is moved outside of the cluster is encrypted. Um, we also support um, kind of customer managed keys. So you have complete control over how the encryption has been performed. 
And now you can see that the restore workflow has been triggered. Um, we've already gone ahead and created a new volume um, inside vCenter. And if I go back to vCenter now and start looking at um, what operations are having happening under TOS, you'll start to see those new um, uh, volume show up. So you can see that we created a new volume from the snapshot that's now getting attached to the Kubernetes node. Um, those operations are happening here. Um, any snapshots that we are taking are also visible over here. Okay. And so if I switch back there, you'll start to see the new volume get created. We will see a new pod, um, which is um, the Kubernetes notion of compute show up. And very soon that application will, will be up and running in this cluster. Um, just to make sure we complete this, this is my terminal view. So you can see um, that I am, I am in that cluster. I've got the CSI, um, the vSphere kind of storage class defined here in terms of namespaces that exist over here. You can see that clone demo namespace got created after we had cloned the application. And if I start to look at the pods over there, you can see that this new MySQL pod is now running um, uh, after we did the restore. So if I go back now, we should have seen that the restore completed. All right, so that kind of wraps up what I wanted to talk about in terms of demo. Um, let me just quickly switch back to slides. Um, we can talk a little bit about what we saw and some of the other integrations we have as well. So this picture over here, there's, you know, I know it's very busy, but this really kind of describes the layers and everything that we saw in the demo. So at the very bottom, um, you know, there, there's vSphere. Um, in this case, it was vSphere 7.0 um, with vSAN and the cloud native storage integration that they've built into the platform. Um, we've got our Kubernetes nodes running as VMs on the platform. And on top of that, we've got a number of different applications uh, deployed as containers in Kubernetes. K10 is installed again in this environment. And what you can, you know, what we saw um, right in the beginning of the demo is that we automatically have discovered all the different applications, the different components, um, and we understand how to kind of back up these applications. We walked through a, an example where we, we backed up MySQL, and again, we leveraged um, volume snapshots. But uh, K10 also has first class integrations with a number of kind of data services where we can actually do database backups um, to get more consistency um, if needed. Um, if I just switch back again to my demo um, over here, something I missed talking about, you'll see um, over here that um, I've got two different Mongo applications I've backed up, but I've done two different kind of operations. For one of them over here, I've leveraged volume snapshots to back up the data. Um, but for the other one, what I've actually gone ahead and done is I am not leveraging volume snapshots. I'm actually integrating directly into Mongo and I'm using the Mongo dump, dump tool to, to extract a database, uh, an application consistent database backup and it's going straight into my backup target. So again, we have those first class integrations. Nothing changes in terms of how you define policies, how you define your workflows, um, but we have the ability to kind of discover these applications and do different things based on the data service. Um, and that's kind of, um, you know, that kind of talks about our different integrations here. Uh, the other thing, um, you know, that we just covered is we have support for a number of different storage providers and we completely, and data services. We completely abstract that from an operations point of view. Your policies, your workflows stay the same, no matter what environment, what cluster, what region you're running in. Um, and then finally, um, when we saw restore, we really saw what it means to coordinate these operations, what the sequence, making sure that the sequence of operations in terms of getting the snapshots back into the cluster, whether it be from a local environment or from that remote environment, bringing up new volumes um, that integrate into cloud uh, container storage over here, um, making sure pods come up, stateful sets are all handled correctly. Uh, the platform takes care of all of those operations. And that's kind of where we invest a lot of time to make sure Everything that you want to do is just a single click operation in this environment. Um, with that being said, I think that's all I wanted to cover. I know I spoke for a long time, but hopefully the demo made it interactive and it kind of gave you a picture of, you know, what the platform can do. Um, I think we would love to open it up for questions, both me and I and Gaurav are here um, and, and hear, from, um, hear from you folks on the call.
Thank you, uh, Weber, and thank you, Ni. Nee. Um, that was indeed, uh, you know, a good overview of both the power of what uh, Cloud Marketplace brings to the table out here, as you have a rich set of applications that want to go ahead and now leverage, uh, you know, the platform needs, as well as, uh, you know, K10 and what it can do to help uh, back up your application. So, um, with that said, I think there are a few questions uh, trickling in. And uh, let me let me try and sort of uh, read some of them, and then maybe ask them to uh, uh, either one of you uh, based on based on what the question is. So I think the the first one I really had was um, in terms of sort of just the installation. Um, you know, can I can I purchase K10 from the VMware Cloud Marketplace? And uh, maybe Ni, I'll just forward that your way. Yeah, uh, thanks, Gaurav, uh, and uh, you know, uh, great question. So. At this point, VMware Cloud Marketplace is actually a bring your own license marketplace, which means that you know, customers who already have an existing license will actually be able to put in that license key and start using it kind of seamlessly within the VMware environments. Uh, we do plan to roll out uh, commerce enablement fairly soon. So at that point, uh, customers will actually be able to you know, browse for the solution, purchase it if they don't already have it, and then use that purchase license key to actually run uh, run the application as well, uh, so that is coming. So stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, th thanks again for the question. All right, great, thanks. Um, I think uh, Weber, maybe this is your your way. Which is uh, what what are the underlying storage systems that Kitten supports? Um, and then if I can uh, maybe club in another question, which is coming along with it, which is integrating. Do you integrate with Dell DTS? Um, I'm not sure what that is, but I'll just same right. Way. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So again, we mentioned earlier, uh, K10 abstracts over a number of different storage solutions as well as data services, which I think is very important because often when you're thinking about the application, it is not the storage you're using, but what data service you're using. On the storage side, we have first class integration with uh, a number of providers, you know, in this case, vSphere, for example, FCD that we built first class integration with number of cloud environments. So even if you're running these clusters in a cloud environment, we support um, out of the box those, um, those storage providers. We also have first class integration with CSI, which is the um, cloud native container storage interface. So that is the way um, going forward, how storage providers are defining the interfaces for their integration into Kubernetes. Um, so if you have a CSI driver for your storage provider, things like pure storage, um, uh, we we integrate with that, um, and that's a first class thing in our in, in our uh, system. On the data service side, again, um, you know we we have the ability to integrate with the data services. We already saw MySQL, things like Postgres, Mongo, Cassandra, um, Redis, Elasticsearch. These are the kind of data services we says we see often, um, and so we have that integration as well. Um, on the Dell DPS side, um, we don't have any integration um, over there. Okay, great. So, so just to summarize, then you do direct as well as CSI-based integration with the underlying storage layers, and then you also go integrate at the uh, data services layer with a variety of modern databases. Okay, good. Yeah, that, that was actually a good summary of my long-winded answer. Yes. No, I. <laughs> um, so, so let's see. So, I think maybe I'll take this one. I think the question is, how can you count the license? Is it based on the deployed container count? So. So I think uh, from a cast and K10 perspective, the licensing metric is actually the number of uh, Kubernetes worker nodes. Um, in fact, on the cast and sort of tri page, there is a lot more detail because there's a fully featured uh, edition of cast and K10 you can use for free. In fact, the picture which Neat showed uh, advertised that. So for uh, smaller node counts, you can actually continue to use that. We have tons of customers who actually do that. And um, you also have varieties in terms of sort of added support, as well as after you increase uh, you know, your threshold, then you can go ahead and sort of purchase it, which uh, uh, there are a variety of options too, but the underlying metric is that. So maybe that's one question. Um, I think back on the storage, uh, wherever this might be your way, which storage types are supported as backup destinations? Yeah, so we support a variety of object store targets right now as backup targets um, or backup destinations. So all the cloud vendors and anything S3 compatible, um, uh, we've been, a number of our customers um, actually use us with on-prem 
uh, um, object storage storage targets. Um, so we support those out of the box as well. Okay. Um, maybe Nee, this is your way, which is like, can you elaborate on what does notifications mean on the marketplace slide? I think you should. Yeah, sure. Uh, so there's a couple of different uh, ways that you know we enable notifications. So on uh, the customer side, you can actually sign up for you know to receive notifications when when a partner publishes a new version of a solution, for example. Uh, and what's really important uh, and useful to many customers is that these notifications can actually be delivered to you in a couple of different channels. So either by Slack or by, by webhook or by email. Um, on you know so you can sign up for multiple of multiple number of notifications and we're actually expanding the kind of notifications that you can receive as well. So in addition to knowing when uh, someone updates a solution, you, we're expanding to include things like, uh, hey, maybe there's a solution that you're following, not quite having the license yet, but you can kind of learn more and get notified whenever, whenever that vendor updates, things like that. So it's really an inbuilt uh, mechanism to, to sign up for these notifications and to receive them across various channels. Okay, uh, that, that's great. Um, I think this one might be your way, uh, Weber, which is, can I migrate my applications from Red Hat OpenShift to VMware's uh, Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, TKG? Yes, so that's a good, great question. Um, mobility and kind of migration is, is one of those first class workflows that we have built into the platform. Um, once you've captured um, a, a a backup of your application in any environment. Um, using the transformations that I talked about, um, we can both transform the data as well as the metadata um, and migrate from um, you know, a, a specific environment to another one, whether it be on the storage level or things that you need to change in the API resources. You know, OpenShift has a lot of uh, things that are very specific to OpenShift. So you can very, in a programmatic manner, define what you want your migration to look like. You know, what would what would you do, for example, for things like a uh, an image uh, stream in OpenShift, for example? How would that show up in in VMware? Um, and then the platform will just apply that and do that um, uh, at an in an automated fashion. Got it. Okay, that's that's good, and I think you showed that transformation feature. So, um, in terms, I, I, there is another one. Um, is it possible to map existing data and backups to newly created policies if, for example, the Kden application is corrupt and needs to be redeployed? So I will uh, field it to you. Uh, Gaur, you mind repeating the question for a second? Yeah, so I think it's basically, uh, can you, is it possible to map existing data and backups to newly created policies if, for mm -hmm. example, the Kden application is corrupt and needs to be redeployed? And I, I think there are two ways to read the question. I'll, I'll let you answer it uh, the way you want, and then maybe I can, I can also try and answer it the second way I can have you. Yeah, it. yeah. I think I, I, I understand what, what, what the question is. I think just to repeat at least my understanding, what this is saying is, you know, let's say I've been using K10 to um, take a number of backups. I have a number of backups and restore points. Um, I need to reinstall, bring back um, from um, K10 from, let's say I, I had a DR or something went wrong. Um, will those still policies um, still kind of um, get bound to those restore points so that my retention schedules and all still stay in place and they do the right things? Um, the answer is yes. Um, we apply labels, um, just to give some more background, we apply labels to each of these um, kind of backups that we take. And so when you create a policy, as long as you're creating the policy with the same parameters and the labels, things get um, previous restore points get bound again. And so your retention will apply and will still continue to clean up and manage those um, those uh, backups. Yeah, no, I think I think I do believe that was the intent of the question. If not, uh, please, please uh, post it again. I think also the only point I'll elaborate on that is, you know, Kten itself is DR. So if itself, uh, if Kten itself is sort of lost, we can sort of DR ourselves back on, right? So, uh, so, so that that's yet another level of uh, residency. Um, there is another question in terms of, can I restore only namespace, persistent volume, or app items without restoring the whole app or container? Yes, absolutely. So um, one of the things we, we saw in our restore workflow is the ability to pick and choose exactly what I want to bring back. 
Um, again, we walk through the interactive workflow, but everything is um, driven by an API. So you can choose to bring back just the data volumes if you want to. Um, let's say you're trying to bring back the, um, let's say the application definition through your pipeline and you want Kasten to just go bring in the data. Um, you can go ahead and do that. The additional thing I'll mention, because all the APIs here are Kubernetes APIs, what that means is however you choose to orchestrate the application being delivered, um, you can, uh, in the same mechanism, just integrate into that workflow how the data should come in. Um, just because it's an API, you can uh, API call unit, you can integrate into that workflow. Got it. Um, I think the next one might be for Yoni Haruka, which is what what are the prerequisites for using VMware Cloud Marketplace? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Gaurav. Um, yeah. So to actually use VMware Cloud Marketplace. Um, so let me, let me back up there to actually browse VMware Cloud Marketplace and just see what's available. You actually don't have any prerequisites, right? So I think I mentioned this earlier. Uh, you are actually free right now to go to marketplace.cloud.vmware.com and browse the catalog just as you would with any other kind of enterprise marketplace, right? So you can kind of check out all of the solutions and um, see what's available, read all about it. Uh, but of course, you need to log in to do more with it. Uh, to actually use a solution via marketplace, you essentially need to have a an account with VMware Cloud Services. So it's very easy to sign up for that. Uh, you know, if if you'd like to do that, please you know feel free to. Uh, if you'd like to do that and you're having uh, issues doing that, please feel free to reach out. Uh, but once you have a an account with VMware Cloud Services, you can you know start deploying the solutions. And of course, you actually need. Um, the VMware platform to which you're deploying to. So once you have those credentials as well as your cloud services account, uh, you can basically utilize the solutions on the ma marketplace catalog. But um, you know, of course, browsing is free, as I mentioned. Yeah. Got it. Okay, no, thank you. Um, uh, maybe I'll trickle in a couple more. I uh, yep. uh, which is essentially on um, the version of vSphere that K10 supports. Um, if you can elaborate on that. Yeah, so we support, um, we, we integrate in with first class disks. So we need, um, the minimum version we need is 6.7 U3 um, for vSphere. Um, that's the version we support. Um, we've also, there are other kind of things that we are qualified for. So Ni had mentioned in her slide, things like TKGI, which are, we are qualified for. Um, the demo you sh uh, saw um, was actually using TKG. So Tanzu Kubernetes grid um, and so, um, those are the kind of things that we support, but from a vSphere perspective, 6.7 U3 is what you need. Got it, okay, thank you. Um, and again, uh, so I, I think you showed this uh, in your demo about uh, you know enabling backup via snapshot exports, but the question really is, uh, does Kten do real backups or is it just snapshots? Right, okay, yeah, and so that's, that's um, I think that's a very important point to, to get across. Um, snapshots alone um, are not backups. Um, they are a tool that you can use to kind of get a consistent point in time. Um, and so K10 uses that tool, but then we actually um, extract the data in a very efficient manner from those snapshots and move them to these backup targets that we have and to enable uh, true backups. And, and really the true backup um, point here is to make sure that um, the fault domain is different from your vSphere cluster or your vSAN cluster. We want to move the data out of that. Got it. All right. Uh, I think maybe the last one I'll, I'll, I'll just squeeze in. Um, I, I usually like to try and close this in 45 minutes. Uh, but I think uh, the the KTN, um, in terms of the, you talked about sort of integration with storage systems, but then you also alluded to the fact that you integrate with uh, modern databases or applications in your uh, slide. Can you can you elaborate on what databases you support? Cool. Um, yeah. So we um, we have an extension mechanism um, that allows us to integrate with a number of data services. So it's actually not just data services. A lot of times, what we see is customers have applications for which you know. Maybe you want to do very something very specific to quiet the application, or you need to do some orchestration um, in your infrastructure after you restore. Maybe you need to go update DNS settings. Um, so we have the ability in that policy layer to define exactly what should happen in the workflow. Um, out of the number, there are a number of data services that we've kind of built first class integration for. 
Um, I'll just kind of repeat some of the ones I talked about earlier. Things like MySQL, Postgres, Cassandra, Mongo, uh, others that we see, things like Elasticsearch, Redis that we're seeing in this environment. Um, I know customers out there have also um, done things like etcd backups as well. So the model, it is very extensible and um, it's very easy to kind of um, plug in into whatever requirements you have. Just going back to what one of the things, slides I had, the goal is to, you know, from an operations perspective, give you the ability to do whatever you need for those day two um, concerns that you have, but not impact the developers in any way, which means don't restrict um, what data services they can or cannot use. Um, you know, there should be no restriction there and really enable whatever they need to do for their application. All right. Okay. So, so again, maybe a range of consistency options all the way from sort of volume level snapshots to going ahead and being sort of database aware to quiesce it all, and also moving up the stack in terms of logical dumps with a variety of customization that you might be able to do to do um, to get the extensibility in. Um, and I think, um, you know, with that, there are a couple of still pending questions that we will try and sort of answer them. Um, you know, after the fact, there are some which sort of talk about um, the Veeam partnership. So I'll try and sort of uh, follow up uh, with that over email. But I think uh, just on this one, I think as you can see in the slide in front of you, there are a lot of ways you can now start engaging. It's very easy as Nian uh, Web have showed you to go to the cloud marketplace. Uh, you know, there's a single line help command which lets you go ahead and install K Casting K10. Um, takes less than 10 minutes, and I think we all sort of uh, have, have tried and tested it. And also, there is a lot of information in terms of uh, blogs and you know demo videos that uh, Web have showed you. So, so take it out for a spin, and if there are any questions, um, variety of ways of uh, you know reaching out to either one of the teams through email, web, Twitter, whatever your favorite form of communication is. But uh, with that said, I do want to thank um, all of you having uh, joined in, and I do want to thank uh, the panelists out here, Weber and uh, Niharika, who also did a great job presenting. So with that, I uh, hope you have a great day and enjoy, enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you.